organization who are not demonstrating those values, that decreases the morale and takes away the motivation for the vast, vast majority of our employees who, as President Bush said, are overwhelmingly people that we're proud of and the greatest professionals that I've seen working in healthcare in my career. So I believe that to be able to move people out who have lost their way is going to be part of the solution in fixing the VA. And in fact, without that, without the ability to get the right people in these jobs and the right people in our leadership positions, I don't think we're going to be able to reform the VA. So this, to me, today is an important day. It's good news uh, for veterans and their families. It's good news for our employees because we need to make sure that everybody who's working in the VA is there for the right reasons. Uh, I don't think that this is going to be um, something that is abused. I think I take it seriously that everyone deserves due process, and we're going to make sure that that due process exists. But when we find evidence, and we've seen a lot of cases recently in the press that have just been so frustrating that, that we remove the employee and the Merit System Protection Board judges bring those employees back. Um, you just shake your head at those cases. So after today, I think we're going to be able to change uh, that course in VA, and it will be a positive step forward. Uh, you mentioned bipartisanship, and, and I think we would all agree that the veterans issue these days seems to be one of the very few areas where members of both parties can get together and try to get things done. This afternoon, as I mentioned, we will have a bipartisan duo up here from the Senate and the House uh, on the Veterans Affairs Committees. What are a couple things you would ask them? What can Congress do in the near term, not long term, but you know, in this Congress? Are there things that Congress can do to help you tackle some of these challenges, and what are some of those? Yeah, well, first of all, I, I think it's really important that we give the message to Congress how important it is that they stay focused on what's right for veterans and don't create uh, a partisan issue over VA. And when you see what's happening in the rest of Washington right now, you can imagine the pressures on our elected members to turn everything into a political issue. So I am very, very proud, particularly of those who serve in our committees, some of the leaders you're going to be talking to today, that they've been able to resist those forces and really stay focused on, on veterans' issues. We're looking uh, out of the Senate right now for them to pass our Appeals Modernization Act. You talked about um, policy and law that hasn't been updated in a while. Our appeals laws haven't been updated since the 1930s. And it now takes, on average, six years to get a decision. If you were to file an appeal today on a disability claim, it will take you six years to get a decision. Without a change in the law, we're not going to get that fixed. The House has passed it. We're waiting for the Senate. We are looking for a uh, solution from Congress to help us find solutions for our choice funding problems. And the good news is, is that we're getting more veterans than ever uh, getting care that they need out in the community and in the VA. But that has actually accelerated our spend rate in the choice program. So we're looking for some help there. And we're looking for legislation that will make the choice program work even better for veterans in the future, like we were talking about. We're also looking for support to modernize the VA. Um, I think most Americans would be surprised to know that our financial systems are running on cobalt technology. The last time people used COBOLT as a programming language was in the 1970s. Our scheduling systems are MS-DOS, those blue screens that I was using 30 years ago when I first got my, my first PC. Um, our buildings, on average, are over 60 years old. We have 450 buildings from the Civil and Revolutionary Wars. Um, and so 
what we really need to do is to modernize our system because our veterans deserve better than we've been giving them. It's why I announced recently that the VA will be leaving its homegrown electronic medical record over 35 years old to the Department of Defense's electronic medical record so that the first time we will have a modern off-the-shelf system from the time you enlist through long-term or end-of-life care. And <laughs> thank you. And we need Congress to we need Congress to step up and support those those uh, types of initiatives. These aren't cheap, but in the long run, uh, this is when you send somebody off to war or to conflict, you have already committed to a lifetime of responsibility. And this is part of our country's responsibility, and not making these investments is simply not responsible. Last question before we, I think we're out of time. Uh, is there a capital improvement plan in the works at the VA? In other words, what does this cost? And how, how do we as a country pay for it? The VA has for years um, not gotten the types of resources that it's needed. So we have a $50 billion capital deficit. Um, and that simply can't be addressed overnight. So what I have announced is, is that we have 1,100 vacant and underutilized buildings. And I've said in the next two years, I have a plan to essentially get rid of vacant and underutilized facilities. I want the ability to take those resources, invest them back in the VA. That's going to mean we're going to need a different type of footprint. And I'll just give you one example as we close here. We had announced that we were going to build a new hospital in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, it took us about five years to get that plan going. And we wanted to build a new hospital for $560 million in Omaha, Nebraska, a new bed tower. Um, and of course, as you know, healthcare is changing. You don't need as many hospital beds anymore. Most care is now ambulatory. So we took the 10% of money that was given to us for design fees, $56 million, to plan the new hospital. And instead of planning a new hospital bed, we took the 56 million. We worked with the community in Omaha, Nebraska, a private public partnership. And the community donated another $40 million, and now we're building a state-of-the-art ambulatory facility for $96 million, so using 10% of taxpayer dollars. And we're going to have a state-of-the-art facility in Omaha that will serve the needs of veterans without building a big bed tower. And I think we need to think about what the footprint of VA is going to look like in the future so that we can get state-of-the-art facilities without having to spend the type of money that we've always thought we needed in the past. And so I think together and working more with the private sector, we're going to be able to reshape the system so everybody's proud and veterans are getting the best care. With that. Again, special thanks to you, Mr. Secretary, for joining us. That wraps it up, and we all wish you good luck um, getting Congress to close 1,100 facilities around the country. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Thanks to Eric Eversole and Tom Donahue. Thank you all for hosting us at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce today. I'd like to recognize Meg, Meg Cabot, the National Director of the Caregiver Support Program at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you for your commitment to serving our military spouses and families. A special... <laughs> A special thanks to Walmart and to the Boeing Company. Thank you for your generous support of the veteran community, and thank you for sponsoring 
the Bush Institutes stand to. And to all the veterans and active military here today, thank you for your selfless service to our country. As many of the service men and women, as many of the service men and women gathered here today know, you aren't the only members of your family who serve. Your spouses serve as well. While our service men and women are deployed, their spouses are the ones taking care of everything at home. They care for the children, they manage the family finances, and they pray that their husbands or wives in uniform return home safely. Master Sergeant Rocky Rodriguez and his wife Marlene joined us at our ranch in 2013 and 2014 for the Bush Center's annual Warrior 100 bike ride. When Marlene talked about Rocky's years of service in the Air Force, she said, we, I say we, served 25 years. I lived every deployment with Rocky, every trial and tribulation. So the day that I said yes to him, I didn't realize the impact his service would have on me. In fact, Rocky so credits Marlene with his recovery that George painted Marlene in his portrait with Rocky. That's why it's so important to make sure that while our servicemen and women receive the support they need when they come home, that we care for their spouses and families too. Today we're discussing ways to improve vet veterans' transition to civilian life in the areas of wellness, education, and employment. While there are over 4 million post-9-11 veterans, there are 8.10 million family members, and we must consider how we can support their transition as well. All caregivers hope for their families to be in good physical and mental health, but as veterans transition to civilian life, they often deal with the stresses of uncertainty and finding new meaning in their lives. Visible wounds, post-traumatic stress, and the lack of stability make veterans more susceptible to issues like depression, addiction, homelessness, and even suicide. And of course, when one family member is suffering, the entire family suffers, leading to an increase in the risk of behavioral issues, anxiety, and depression in military children, too. Just as veterans need good health care when they return home, caregivers need access to quality care for themselves and for their children. 66% of military families say they have difficulty finding good and affordable child care. And this is one of the reasons why military families are 27% 27 less, 27 less likely to have dual incomes and why 21% of military spouses who want or need to work are unemployed. 15% of military caregivers spend 40 hours a week at home caring for their veteran and often spend even more time caring for their children when child care is unavailable. In order to ensure that our care caregivers have the opportunity to find meaningful work and contribute financially, to their household. We need to ensure that caregivers and family members are eligible for the same transition services that are offered to veterans through the government and through the nonprofit community. <laughs> Stephen Schwab is here today representing the Elizabeth Dole Foundation. The Elizabeth Dole Foundation's mission is to create an America where military caregivers are empowered, appreciated, and recognized for their service to our nation. Through their Hidden Heroes caregiving community, caregivers around the country can access a digital forum where they can find emotional support for themselves and their families, and where they can learn from other caregivers, and where they can discover resources and programs that are available in their own communities. The Elizabeth Dole Foundation is a terrific example of a support group directed at improving the well-being of those who help our service members, and the Bush Institute applauds their work. Veterans and caregivers all want their children 
to be properly educated, but the average military family will move six to nine times during their child's school career, an average of three times more frequently than non-military families. States and local school districts need to make sure that military children have equal opportunities for academic success. This means having teachers and school administrators who understand the challenges of relocating to a new school, the differences in achievement standards and course offerings, high school graduation requirements, extracurricular activities, and how difficult it is for students to create a new life in a new school. While there are plenty of organizations committed to supporting military children, few programs exist to assist with school transition and academic support. It's our responsibility to make sure that students are not disadvantaged because they have a military parent. We need to place our military children on a path to success, preparing them for a bright future in college and beyond. Just like their spouses, studies show that caregivers' primary concern when transitioning to civilian life is employment, their own employment. Military spouses often spend their marriage moving their family around the country and around the world. On average, military families move to a community every two to three years, making it hard to keep a job. This displacement causes periods of unemployment and a weak professional network. Most military families need two incomes, and too many are forced to live paycheck to paycheck. And 80% of military spouses say that their job search has caused stress within their marriage. Some companies already recognize that hiring military spouses isn't only the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. La Quinta Inns is one of those companies. As a member of the Military Spouse Employment Partnership, they're helping military spouses find jobs, and they're providing training to help them enter a new career field. And just this week, Starbucks committed to hiring 10,000 veterans and military spouses by 2018 and 25,000 hires by 2025. The Elizabeth Dole Foundation, La Quinta Inns, and Starbucks are just a few organizations that have identified themselves as leaders in helping our veteran caregivers and families in the transition to civilian life. And I'm grateful for their example. I want to thank the other 70 plus organizations recognized here today, government agencies, business, nonprofits, academia, and philanthropy. Thanks to you for your commitment to our veterans and their families. As you work to improve veterans' transition, I ask that you also consider how you can support the hidden heroes, the spouses, the fathers and mothers, the children of loved and the loved ones who also serve our country. Military families are American families. They have the same priorities to create a nurturing home, to take care of their loved ones, to find a strong education for their children, and to be financially secure. And they do so with more difficulties and obstacles. I'm reminded of the old line that the dancer Ginger Rogers did. She did, said, she did everything that the great Fred Astaire did, except that she did it backwards and in high heels. <laughs> Our military is the strength of our nation, and our service members are the strength of our military, and our caregivers are the strength of our veterans and wounded warriors. Their devotion to our men and women in uniform and their commitment to their marriage, to their family, and to our country is an inspiration to, a, to us all. Thank you all, and God bless you.